Hi, I'm Dennis Fisher. Welcome to this Lab Matters webcast from Kaspersky Lab. Today I have my colleague Vladimir Zepelensky with me and we're going to talk about application whitelisting and how that can help uh, protect end users and corporate users. So Vladimir, today you know, the, the average user, just a home user, not even an enterprise user, has access to a huge amount of data, whether it's applications, on the mobile device, desktop, at work, at home. Um, how do you go about separating all that data into you know, categories, good, bad, indifferent? Yeah, yeah. You know, it, it, there's really a lot of software exists. And if today, for example, I'm able to access one zettabyte of digital information according to IDC research, mm. then just in the several years, it's gonna be 40 times more. It's incredible growth, you know? And of course, we need to distinguish between bad, uh, white, and something that is in the middle, a gray software, so, which is especially most dangerous. And the whitelisting should become, or clean and trusted software should become whitelisted. And there should be an operating systems, drivers, or other prevalent software which is important and popular among the users. Okay, so how exactly does the application whitelisting work? And, you know, how can it help users in these, in these situations? You know, there are, there are a number of disadvantages in traditional approaches. For example, the more software is released, and the more malware is released, the more uh, antivirus update size. It's really a problem because we cannot distribute a huge amount of data to the end user. And practically, practically whitelisting is cloud-based technology, so you don't need to distribute anything to the user. Okay. Once the user requested the information, you may answer, yes, this is a reputation of particular uh, file. On the other hand, if uh, this gray zone where unknown malware, malware comes from becomes one day too dangerous for you. Mm -hmm. Because you know, the mo uh, about 60% companies ban the access to a lot of web resources because of digital threat comes mostly from web. So if one day you decide that this um, digital environment, gray environment is too dangerous for your corporate network, for example, you may close just the board against the, the uh, information from the, from the web. Right. And this, particular case, the only uh, default deny, which is based on whitelisting, is the only solution here. And so is, is there a big difference in the effectiveness between uh, application whitelisting and traditional blacklisting? Is one more effective than the other? Well, we can't say that whitelisting is more effective than blacklisting. They're both supplementing technologies. Okay. But in each, and, and this is a different, that in each segment, uh, whitelisting and blacklisting have its own effectiveness. For example, the effectiveness of, of uh, blacklisting in, uh, in an independent test, according to independent test, is about you know, 60% only. Okay. A week after the new malware is released, it's only about 70% only. It's, it's, even, it's really low. Um, whitelisting immediate effectiveness, because this is cloud-based technology, is about 85%. Those only both technologies combine it together give an effective protection for the user and for the endpoint. Okay, and whitelisting isn't exactly, it's not a brand new technology. It didn't just yeah. come out last month or anything yeah. like that. Is there a difference between um, the approaches that, that different solutions take to whitelisting? I think there is a lot of differences. And the only reason why, because whitelisting, even though it's whitelist spread, in uh, commercial products, it's used almost in all commercial products today in, of all big vendors, but it's actually never been tested. So ah. if we know that blacklisting been tested with a number of independent testers and how to measure its effectiveness and quality, then there's no any idea, no any common KPI how to measure the effectiveness of whitelisting. So they may say we have a, you know, several billion of records in our whitelisting database, but how can they really prove it? Sure. Yeah, that's that's a big uh, that's a big point because there are there is so much data out there. There are so many applications, yeah. and it doesn't it doesn't help if you just collect this massive database and don't do anything. Indeed, with it, right? Indeed, there's you know no sense to collect a huge amount of data. There is it's not enough, I would say, because the data must be effective, and for this purpose, you must know which software is prevalent and popular among the user at this particular moment. Right. All right, Vladimir, thank you very much. Thank you all for joining us. And for more Lab Matters webcasts, you can check out our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash Kaspersky.